Hi, Liz. Hi, Karen. We're in the portable library kitchen, <laughs> and it's your house. So welcome to uh, our cooking series. Thanks. I'm so happy you could be here. Thanks for inviting me. So um, presenting today, Liz Kosha with sweets. All right. So thanks. OK. Well, um, as Karen said, this is uh, my home, so welcome to the kitchen. And today what we're going to do are four Italian cookies. So these are um, very common Italian cookies that you see at Christmas time, Italian weddings, of course. Um, these are just sort of part of your Christmas, um, Christmas platter of cookies. Uh, before I get started, I want to stress that there's no single recipe um, for any of these. The, um, these are very kind of traditional cookies, so they've been passed down through families. Um, I'm just going to kind of show you real quick some, as I was doing my research, uh, some of my old notes from my mother, <laughs> uh, my aunt. You know, these are, these are recipes that have gone through generations. This first one that we're going to do um, is one that my uh, grandmother would, would do. So, you know, these are like 100 years old. Um, so don't feel like um, it has to be exact as I'm doing it, but we have posted these uh, to the library website, and I've tried to get as clear as possible with the instructions. But even as you're going along, uh, you might say, oh, this seems a little dry, let me add a little more milk. You might vary it um, in, in the process of your making it. So the four that we're going to do are uh, the, the biscotti, which uh, in, in Italy, biscotti is just cookie. And so this first cookie is a very simple, plain cookie. It's a soft cookie. Uh, that you can shape, um, and so at Christmas time we're going to shape it in candy canes and wreaths, um, and then frost and decorate. Um, it's often served um, in the morning with your coffee. Um, then we're going to do what people think of as the biscotti, which is the twice baked, twice baked cookie. Um, that's often, you know, you find those in coffee shops and that you dip. Um, then we're going to do another cookie that is a chocolate cookie that's nicknamed the chocolate meatball. Um, again, lots of variations of the chocolate meatball, um, and uh, we'll talk about that as we, as we um, make that. And then finally, we're going to do a cherry cookie because it's a nice bright cookie. It adds some color. Um, OK, so let's start. We're going to start with the soft biscotti. And then as a simple um, flour, sugar, egg recipe, um, you get the flavor in this cookie from the extract that you use. So I prefer the lemon extract, although some people might like orange, some people might like almond. Um, in my house, we always did lemon. So you start by mixing the flour, salt, and baking powder together and setting that aside. So I did that earlier today, just kind of mix that in together, that way you're not fussing later on. And then you're going to cream your um, butter uh, and your um, sugar together. So it's just very common to, um, in cookie recipes, to just cream butter and sugar um, as a starting point for your baking. Now, you don't need a KitchenAid or a fancy mixer. Um, you can do these with a hand mixer, um, you can do it with a spoon, um, whatever, uh, whatever you have um, in your kitchen is fine. So that's going to mix for about two to three minutes. Um, one of the things I like to stress is having your ingredients prepared. Uh, it's really important if you can have your butter um, and eggs at room temperature. Just makes it 
you know, mixing a little easier, um, and it uh, just kind of helps the ingredients to flow better. All right. So uh, we took a little interlude so that the butter and sugar could mix together, and now I'm going to add the eggs. And you do this one at a time uh, to give each egg a chance to blend in. So I'll just let that go for a second. Do your second one. And now we're going to add our um, extract. And like I said, um, I like lemon, so I add a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of lemon extract to the mix. Uh, there certainly are a range of prices in vanilla. I use pure vanilla, uh, but I don't spend a lot of money on the very expensive ones. You can get them, you know, $60.00 for a few ounces, but I just buy the inexpensive ones because these are cookies, you know. <laughs> People are eating them rapidly. <laughs> All right. Um, now, uh, what we're going to do next is add the dry ingredients. So once again, I just need to step out of our frame so I can get over to our dry ingredients. Welcome, Nancy. Nancy's joining Liz in the library, the portable library kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> so. I feel very fortunate. This is a beautiful library kitchen. <laughs> well, thanks for coming, Nancy. I was just about to add the dry ingredients, and as you probably know, um, when you're adding dry ingredients you and you have a milk to add as well, you alternate. Now, I always start with flour, then milk, then flour, then milk. Is that how you do yours? That's how I do mine, too. Okay. All right. So I did not know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> there go. So I add some of the flour. And get that started again. Yeah, I find that the more I have of the wet and dry ingredients, the more times I may even need to alternate, mm -hmm. especially with a big cake or something. So, great point. Yeah. And I'm going to add a little more. And Nancy, when um, we started, we were talking about the creaming butter and sugar together. Mm -hmm. And is that typical for all cookie re recipes and cake recipes? No, the creamer method is a really um, popular method, and it gives you a wonderful way of keeping the water it, that's in your butter incorporated with the rest of your ingredients. However, there are some recipes, for example, brownie recipes, where you may melt the butter, incorporate the sugar, have the sugar melt some. That's how you get the crust on top of the brownies. And um, and then there are still others, cake recipes, where instead of this creamer method as we know it, you may use vegetable oil or something like that. In which case, once you've whisked your eggs in, you know, you, and your sugar is always going to settle, but you're on your way and you're going to have that different kind of cake texture. Okay. But this is my favorite, so reliable. Uh-huh, yes. Um, so it's not, it's not where you just dump everything in at once. Yeah, you're going to have, you're going to know the difference, aren't you? <laughs> okay. I think that's why cake mix was created, but not the same. <laughs> right. Okay, so now we have our dough, and it's a very sticky dough. Um, and this needs to refrigerate for about 45 minutes. So we're going to pop this batch in the refrigerator. And then later today or tomorrow, we're going to use this to make more cookies. But in the meantime, none of you want to sit around that long, um, we are going to use a batch that I made earlier. And Nancy and I are going to shape these. Um, into wreaths and candy canes oh, and how whatever you want to do. So let's just flour our surface and our hands a little. Are we wanting this? And we're going to be using um, a cookie sheet that I I like parchment paper. Um, I, I do just <laughs> keeps your cookie sheets clean and you don't have to wash them. <laughs> yeah. So I use silicone. Um, oh. Nice. I, uh, mats, mm -hmm. and I find them 
Very good. I use sometimes I use parchment paper, but sometimes I use silicone mats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I the like same thing. You don't need to clean your cookie sheets. Yeah. Afterwards. I like that. Yeah. I would like that. I, um, I also have a fear of my cake sticking in cake pans when I'm going to turn them out. Mm -hmm. And you know, parchment just changed my life. Yeah. Right. Yep. No more yep. of the flour and stuff. Just grease it. Parchment. A little more grease, and off you go. Yep. You know. Yep. Yeah. So just uh, flour your hands a little bit, and then take a okay. small portion. So uh, I'm not very good at this part of it. <laughs> so I just do like a few circles. And these are also the wonderful knot cookies, right? That you can, I uh, made them many times with, with um, ladies who remember this recipe from Italy. And they, um, you can just tie a simple little knot in them, and then once they bake, they're lovely little plump, plump babies that you can dump, you can put your icing on, as we're mm -hmm. going to do. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun yeah. to do them. You may want to wait till your child is um, old enough <laughs> 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 if you care about the shapes. But no, your wreaths are beautiful, lovely. But the nice thing about Christmas cookies, and the reason we're doing this with the library, is because we want you to have fun with it. Um, you know, this isn't nuclear science, right? It's sugar and flour yeah. and eggs, so have some fun. Make some wreaths, make a few handy cane shape things, right? If they don't look perfect, they're going to get eaten. Right? <laughs> Nobody's going to say, oh, I'm not going to eat that because it doesn't look exactly like a candy cane. So just have some fun with it. We're just going to do a few here and pop this in the oven just so that we have a few to show you um, when uh, we get time to do some icing and some decorating. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I found that doing these things with my sons when they were in, you know, elementary school and preschool, and later in some cases, has meant that I've ended up with now they're doing this on their own with their little children. Yeah. And when I saw the gingerbread house that my 18-month-old <laughs> granddaughter decorated, it was uh, half marshmallows, <laughs> but I was couldn't have been more thrilled because They've begun something that they'll have, just like my boys always had them. So well, it's, an, it's an exciting way to start something new in your family at a time when we're all at home more than we meant to be mm -hmm. or have had the opportunity to be and can create some new traditions. Great. And Nancy, before you came, I was talking about how in, in my family this particular recipe was one that was, has been passed down from my you know, grandmother to my to my um, aunt and my mother, and we would do this every year. It's a very uh, common uh, cookie. Well, I think I may have mentioned to you the first time I I came across the knots that, or this cookie recipe it was when a woman who uh, was a hundred years old had not made the recipe in sixty years because it was written in Italian and it was her mother with whom she had last baked it. And so um, we baked the recipe together, and we, um, she loved it. When she bit into it, I've never seen such a look on her face. You know, it was a wonderful thing. And uh, so I, I feel grateful to be have an opportunity to do it again with you. Wonderful. Good tradition for us. Thank you. So, so we have a dozen cookies. You're going to pop those in the oven. And um, they take about 8 to 10 minutes. It's a 350 oven. Um, obviously, we've preheated that. Uh, you want to keep an eye on it because um, they do brown pretty quickly. So I always set my timer for 8 minutes and then check it at you know, 8 and 9 and so forth. You just want the bottoms to be lightly brown. And then when we take them out, you're going to cool them on a wire rack and then when they've cooled, then we're going to uh, ice them and um, decorate them however we'd like. Okay, so that ends our soft biscotti. Um, I'm calling it the soft biscotti because the next cookie we're going to do is the biscotti that most people think of, which is a hard, crunchy. Welcome back, Nancy and Liz. Uh, what's on the agenda now?
Next is going to be our tradition, what I would say is traditional biscotti in the sense it's the one that people here are most familiar with. So this is the hard biscotti. Um, it's twice baked. Um, and it's served in Italy oftentimes after dinner with a very sweet wine called Vin Santo. Mm -hmm. And you dip it. So you can either have it with your coffee or you can have it um, with, your, with your glass of very sweet Vin Santo. Uh, so to start, this is a little bit more complicated because to start you have to roast your almonds. So I started um, this morning with um, raw unsalted almonds, and I roasted these for about 10 minutes at 350, and you have to keep an eye on them like everything else. I have many times burned them um, when that's no fun to waste all those almonds. Oh, yeah. um, but then once they cool, you're just going to um, cut them into large pieces. So you can do halves or quarters. Um, and what you're trying to do is just get some nice chunks that are going to go into your cookies. And I'm going to have Nancy keep up the chopping while I go on to the next step of the recipe, which is whisking your eggs and vanilla together. So for this recipe, it calls for three eggs. And again, I always like to have my um, eggs at room temperature. Nancy and I are going to share the space here so you can see. And those are large eggs? These are large, yep, large eggs from Stewart's. Yeah. <laughs> I had to run out this morning because I ran out of eggs. Now, I do think that when you're doing a lot of baking, that um, having extra eggs on hand is important, especially if you're using farm eggs here. Oh. Be because the farm eggs have shells that are unpredictable. Some are thin, some are thick. And also, it's harder for folks on a farm. And let I, I me say, I do prefer these eggs. I think the beautiful golden yolks and, you know, the richer diet of the chickens is all really well worth it. Also, they live better. You know, they're not caged as so many of the commercial layer hens are. But you do need to be sure you have some extras around because every egg may not be the same as every other egg. The other thing is, is I would always break them one at a time into a cup and have a look at them if they weren't from a commercial source because that way you just know you don't have two yolks. You don't have you know, all the interesting things that can happen with these beautiful blue and green eggs from some of these um, more interesting heritage breeds of chickens. So. That's an excellent point. I, I remember in home ec them telling us that you always cracked your eggs into a separate bowl because you never knew if one of them had gone bad. And you didn't want to ruin your whole batch with, um, you know, with a bad egg if you just sort of mixed it in without looking at it. Yeah, if you crack an egg and the white around it doesn't sit up at all around the yolk, but instead it's just entirely flat, that's a concern in terms of freshness. If you turn the egg in a cup to the light and it has kind of an iridescent sheen, or obviously using your senses, if it doesn't smell the best or seems an off color, you, you just don't want to use that egg. And it happens, I think, in all eggs, but I, I think for these kinds of things where you're really counting on good health and reliability, better safe than sorry. If you think yeah. there's a problem, easier yeah. to dispose of it. Absolutely. Don't, you don't want to waste all the other ingredients for one bad egg. Yes. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, good. So I have whisked my um, vanilla and almond extracts with my three eggs. Earlier today, I uh, mixed our dry ingredients together, and this is simply um, white flour, sugar, and baking soda, and just a pinch of salt. Now, this recipe calls for seven eighths of a cup of sugar, and I've made this recipe for years, and I always thought, why seven eighths? And so I've tried, you know, I've said, well, I'm just going to throw in a cup. Well, no, it's, it's too sweet. Really? Yeah, or I'm like, I'm going to use a half a cup. 
No, it didn't. So for some reason, seven eighths is what works the best with this. So um, what we're going to do, like we've done before, is we're going to um, mix our dry ingredients with the um, egg mixture and just stir until blended. Now this morning when I made a batch, which we're going to move to in a minute, I just did all this by hand. It's a very simple recipe to do by hand, but for our purposes for the video, I'm just going to mix it in the mixer because it doesn't take quite as long. <laughs> One of the really interesting aspects of biscotti is that it doesn't contain any butter or any of those other kinds of fats. The only fats in it would come from the egg, which is a delicious fat, and the yolk, and makes it rich, and also from the nuts. So it's a very different kind of cookie, and it makes, gives it the nice texture that I think we all like so much. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I like is the silica, they're not silica sheets, these are just the inexpensive plastic sheets from the dollar store. Um, and uh, I, like, I like these because you can simply pick them up and dump your almonds right into your mixer so that um, the almonds get mixed in with the ingredients. So, very inexpensive way to quickly get your nuts added. They're also great because you can put a sharpie on them and use one for chicken and one for or one for meat mm -hmm. and one for you know. garlic. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So what we have here is another very sticky dough, and um, this one does not need to get chilled. Um, but what this what happens with this one? is we have to flour, um, excuse me, we have to butter and flour our baking pan. So Nancy's going to do that. And while she does that, I'm just going to clean off our uh, mixer. This is exciting. I've never made biscotti before. And I, for example, I didn't know this. This is awesome. And this one does require you to have a lot of flour on your hands because it's a pretty sticky dough. So I'm going to wash my hands really quickly. Yeah, important lesson. Once your dough starts to stick, clean off your hands and start over either with flour on your hands in a process like this or oil. But it's only going to get worse. <laughs> it's not going to get worse. So Nancy did a nice job of putting that uh, butter on the cookie sheet, and now I've given it a nice coating of flour. And now, taking some flour on my hands, I am going to pull this dough out of the pan, divide it into two, and make two logs with it. Okay, so Nancy is taking our soft biscotti out of the oven and putting it onto a wire rack. And I am taking our hard biscotti. I have um, created two logs, or two, two balls, and what I'm doing is I'm getting these into 12 inch logs. And um, I'm trying to get them so that they're even and they're one and a half inches wide and a half inch tall. And Nancy, would you turn, turn the oven down to 300 for us? Wow, that's a low temperature. Yeah, these cook at a very low temperature. Now, do you ever bake these on convection or you always bake them? on a regular bake cycle. I always bake on regular bake. And I would love to hear your know. thoughts on that because I'm just, I've never had an oven with convection. So it's new to me. It makes me nervous because baking recipes aren't written for convection. And you know mm -hmm. it affects the time. Mm -hmm. But if I'm baking a lot of cookies, 
I might take my temperature down a few degrees, maybe not all the way down 25. But that way I know the air is going all through and I can have multiple pans in there on multiple That's levels, great idea. you know. But I also check them and move them around halfway through. Okay. So great idea. just to be sure the bottoms aren't scorched or something. But, mm -hmm. but I was asking because I think a lot of these cookie recipes only are right with regular baking, mm -hmm. don't you? Mm -hmm. I agree. So I like to be sure that I'm um, at the measurements that the recipe calls for. So I just have a little uh, ruler, <laughs> your, your basic 10 cent ruler, and see, okay, that's 12 inches, that's 12 inches, that's, oh, I'm a little, oh wait, the wrong one. Uh, yep, that's about an inch and a half, an inch and a half, and a half inch tall. So these are going to go into the oven for 50 minutes, 5-0. So that's a very long, slow bake. And um, I'm going to take a break here, wash my hands, and pull out the batch that I made earlier today. Okay, welcome back. So this morning I made um, the, the biscotti so that I could show you uh, the next step of it. Because as we said, the biscotti has to cook for 50 minutes. Um, and that's just a long time in the video. <laughs> So what we do is we take a serrated knife and we just um, cut these at a 45 degree angle. And it's up to you in terms of how big you want these. Some people like the really small size, some like them longer. So um, don't be afraid, they're gonna, they're gonna break. Some of them are gonna break. It's just gonna happen. Uh, I like mine to be about a half inch. How, long, how does that affect your, your second bake when from a time standpoint, in terms of how the width of the cut? Um, well, these are going to bake a second time um, for about 25 minutes. So 20 to 25 minutes. So depending on how thick you make them, mm -hmm. is going to vary how long that's going to take. I see. So you just put these on a, a cookie sheet with nothing. There's, you know, you don't have anything. It's, I don't use parchment in this case. I don't use butter, flour. Okay. I just set those right on a cookie sheet, and and you want to, may want to talk about the serrated knife because I think a lot of folks may not realize how bright they are in some of these circumstances. And obviously, this is not an easy cut. It is not an easy cut. It is not, and so it takes um, a bit of strength here and um, a little patience because you don't want to break them. The, the teeth on the serrated knife, I think, always make a great cake slice or, in this case, a great cookie slice because they saw through more gradually and don't break it up the way that, say, the kind of chef knife you were using before would do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always think it's odd that cake servers never are serrated, you know, these uh -huh. ornamental things they give yeah. you. And, when in fact that's what you need to have a good tidy slice. Mm -hmm. I like mine on a large slice, of course. Okay. Now again, just for the purposes of the video, um, we're not going to take the time to cut all these. We'll do that a little later. Um, the important thing is then that you uh, keep again keep an eye on them. You're going to put them in a, a cooler oven. Now this time it's going to be two seventy five. So 275, set it for 10 minutes, um, see how they look, might need 12 minutes, might need 14, and then you're going to flip it over and do the other side. So you want them good and dry. Um, once they are, once you have that brown that you like, you're going to cool them on a wire rack, and then if you like, you can always melt some chocolate. I did that earlier today. <laughs> And you can just dip half of them in chocolate. Oh. That makes a nice presentation. I <laughs> Some people like um, half with chocolate and maybe a little uh, chopped almond or chopped almonds or chopped walnuts, some, something like that. Some people like, you know, some peppermint sprinkles. You know, everybody has something a little different. I like them plain. Uh, this is a cookie that I don't feel needs chocolate, but some people just feel like chocolate should be on everything. So that's okay too. That's true. So we're drying these out in the oven, right? 
right? So they keep a long time. They do. Keep That's them lovely. in a sealed container. Um, I make a batch and put some in the freezer, um, and that way you can just pull them out whenever you have a craving. Okay. That Hi, is and Nancy. Welcome back. What's on the What's on the stove for today? Okay. So the next cookie we're going to do is called the chocolate meatball. <laughs> so this is for your chocolate lovers. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of chocolate meatball recipes out there, Nancy. Really? And um, some have eggs, some don't have eggs. What is common to this recipe is the spices. So this recipe includes the cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg. Oh, so holiday. Yes. That's wonderful. Yep, exactly. So um, I selected one of the recipes that doesn't have an egg in it. Um, I think it comes out fine. I, mm -hmm. I always wondered, did somebody just forget to write that they needed an egg? But yeah. <laughs> regardless, I've used it for years, and um, I think it tastes really good. Oh, yeah. So um, I start, as I always do, with butter and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have a stock up on your butter yeah. and sugar anytime they're on sale. Um, now this recipe is, um, includes cream cheese. Mm. Um, I made it a half batch earlier, and so for right now I'm just adding um, the other four ounces because the full recipe takes eight ounces. Right. It does make quite a few cookies, yeah. so you have to think about that in terms of how many chocolate cookies you want to have on your platter. Um, okay, so that's going to mix. And um, then what we're going to do is we're going to add our dry ingredients, which I've already put together. And this is basically your flour, baking powder, um, and because these are chocolate, this is also your, your baking cocoa is in here. Um, I, add, I went ahead and added my spices, your cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg to this. Um, and then this will be added with the milk, just as we did in an earlier recipe, where we alternate. We start with dry ingredients, use the wet ingredients, then the dry, and then the, the wet. So you get that nice emulsification when you've got that stage incorporated on. Mm -hmm. It's really a great idea. Yeah, exactly. This recipe, uh, unlike any of the others, also does not have any extract in it. Oh. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, again, well, I don't know why there's no extract, but it's just not one of the flavorings that they use. Well, you know, that kind of makes it a recipe for our tongues because vanilla has become very, very expensive. The, mm -hmm. All the pollinators for vanilla seem to have been affected over the last few years by various things. And so now, unfortunately, it's very, very hard to get vanilla. And you can see it in the prices. I'm, I, I'm really thinking of giving it as Christmas gifts this year. But, uh, I do. <laughs> yeah, you know what you're getting. Um, but, uh, but in fact, you know, we, um, I, I was reading a, a, a young pastry chef's um, recipe. It's a new recipe for chocolate chip cookies the other day. And she doesn't use vanilla because she said it's, you know, we're past that now as far as she's concerned for everyday baking because she says her cookies are just as good. So. I may start to try that, oh, and I think that before you turn back from a recipe, look at this delicious recipe. She has treated us to these before. Um, but before you turn back from a recipe, because you got this $8 bottle of vanilla you have to buy, make the recipe about it. It'll be fine. And Nancy, have you ever substituted an, another extract? Um, sometimes I've used almond instead just to get that almond flavor, mm -hmm. but I also like the almond with the vanilla and some of these like you can have in your biscotti, which is so delicious. Um, I've also seen make your own vanilla kits, um, oh. and those, uh, you take a vanilla bean and then you mix it with vodka, and then you wait and use that <laughs> as an extra. Okay. But it has to age for something like two months. There's a kit on the King Arthur website now to do that. Wow. But Is that equally expensive? Because the vanilla beans must be expensive. Um, they are expensive, but I do think you get a great deal more extension out of it. I, I couldn't say to you, I know that it's great. It's really, really cost effective. But um, 
I think if you're careful and shop for Benelli, you might come out better. I would certainly wouldn't use great vodka. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nancy, one of the things I do is I like Mexican vanilla. Ooh. And as you know, I lived in Texas for 30 years, yes. and so we would go to the Mexican market Ooh. and buy vanilla. Wonderful. And um, you can get it online, mm -hmm. and it's not as expensive. Oh, it's good. not. I, I, it's pure Mexican vanilla, so I, I don't know what's different, but it does have a slightly different flavor, almost yeah. like a coconut flavor. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, and that so was good. I often use that. Yeah. Um, I didn't in these recipes just because I wanted to stay traditional, but if I'm just baking for ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, uh, chocolate chip cookies or yeah. peanut butter cookies, I'll just use the Mexican vanilla. Okay, so that is um, a mix oh, of great. all our wet and dry ingredients. And now this recipe, <laughs> a little bit of the uh, paper from the butter. Um, this recipe uses um, chocolate chips. And um, if you like nuts, it calls for um, nut, chopped nuts. I like nuts, so I did go ahead and chop up some walnuts mm -hmm. um, and put that in with our um, chocolate chips. And I'm going to add that. And Nancy is going to reach over and grab the pre-made um, dough because just like all the other recipes <laughs> that we talked about, except for the hard biscotti, this has to chill um, for at least an hour. Okay, so Nancy and I are going to take a minute and get our hands good and floury and we're going to make our chocolate meatballs next. So Nancy and I were just discussing how big do you want your, your meatballs. And it really depends on your family and your preferences. Um, and how many do you want to be giving away? Yes. <laughs> or how much time do you have? So if I get really tired, I make really big meatballs. Um, if I have a lot of people to give to, I'll make smaller ones. But the idea is, just like you do with a meatball, if you make your own meatballs, yeah. is you just roll it between your palms, and so it gets nice and smooth. So about the size of a walnut is good, because that'll make a nice cookie. And then you're just going to place that on an ungreased cookie sheet. I use parchment again. Um, probably if I wasn't using parchment, Nancy, I would put a little um, little butter on there just so that they don't stick. No, I could I could definitely believe that. Um, yeah. The um, do these spread very much? How much space do they need on the? I like sheet? to keep them a couple inches apart. They're not big spreaders, mm -hmm. but they will grow. So something like this is mm -hmm. okay. Yep. All right. And so in an average cookie sheet. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't do, certainly wouldn't do more than 12 cookies on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I just found this wonderful um, parchment at, just at the grocery store that has a grid on it. And I, I, oh. So never will my cookies touch again. <laughs> They're all. <laughs> wow. Touch me. Yeah. Very I mean, nice. it's just helpful, you know, when you're sitting there kind of, mm -hmm. why am I doing this now? I'm a little tired. So, and this is an awesome thing to do with your children, isn't it? It is. We can all make balls like this. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yours That's are, right. Yours are nice. And they can, you know, again, it's just like that one. I was like, oh, that one got a little yeah. big. Didn't look quite. You want uniformity on your pan because otherwise what's going to happen is some are going to be done and some aren't. So, you know, if you want to change size on your second pan, that's fine. But on one pan, try and keep them all about the same size. With uh, drop cookies, I sometimes use like a little ice cream scoop. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of helpful too for measuring. But, you know, with um, this kind of thing where you really need the compression, mm -hmm. isn't good. it's better to just use your hands and get it done. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Now, these are going to bake at 375. So here you go. Here's a little higher temperature. Right. Um, and so you really want to pay attention to your time. So um, the recipe says it's for 15 minutes. Again, I always start low. I'll start probably at 12 minutes checking it. 
Um, you want the bottoms to be have a nice brown to them, mm -hmm. but not burned. And um, then you're going to cool them on a wire rack. Once they're cooled, we've made a little bit of icing, and we're just going to dip it in the icing. It saves time. You're not you're not using a butter knife to try and spread yeah. it. You're just going to dip it in the icing, and then you've got a nice presentation. If you're tired, you can also just take powdered sugar, mm -hmm. <laughs> skip the Ooh, icing, yeah. put it in a little tea strainer, and uh -huh. just tap your um, tap the edge of the tea strainer uh -huh. and put um, the powdered sugar on top, and then you have sort of the snow on the mountain kind of yeah, look. Yeah. Um, so, and then you it. might do that again before you serve them, right? If yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's probably better when they're hot. Warm. So, yeah, yeah. To adhere yeah. a little bit. So if you didn't like want to shape all these right now, you could keep some of this in the fridge, right? Absolutely. And then when you're before guests are up, well, we don't have any guests now, right? So, <laughs> but before you want to have some nice fresh cookies uh -huh. or warm cookies, you could take them out then and bake them off, and you would be Absolutely. ready to go. Absolutely. I made this dough two days ago, and it's perfectly fine. So don't feel like you have to do everything all at once. What a great idea. All right. That's it for our chocolate meatballs. Oh, the last cookie. What's on the menu, Liz? Our last cookie is a cherry cookie. And this one, I keep repeating myself, but has a lot of variations to it. Um, obviously, the key ingredient that makes this different is that it uses cherries. And the traditional recipe uses those very sweet maraschino cherries. So if you're not a fan... <laughs> But they're beautiful. But they're and they beautiful. add color. Mm -hmm. And um, when you taste this cookie, you'll change your mind. <laughs> right. Well, my sister-in-law makes this recipe, but she doesn't like the maraschino cherries, mm -hmm. so she uses the dried cherries that you would use as if you were making a fruit cake. Oh, okay. So lots of people can, you know, say, oh, well, that's too sweet for me. I'm yeah. going to do something else. Um, this recipe... Um, is is the one I'm using uh, comes from a, a friend of mine her, passed down from her mom. Um, it makes a lot of cookies. Okay, so I cut the recipe in half because really, who needs like you know uh, the recipe makes 175 cherry cookies. Wow, and that's a lot. That's a lot. That's of a cherry lot of cookies. cherry cookies. So. <laughs> Um, I cut it in half. I did post the original recipe, mm -hmm. however, if you really want that many cookies. So, butter and sugar, but this time um, we're adding a little bit of Crisco. Okay. Now, the original recipe calls for spry. Oh, what uh, is spry? I know! <laughs> spry is a very old term uh -huh. for lard. All right. Okay, but what we now use Crisco. So some variations of this recipe use all Crisco, um, some use all butter, but I like my friend's idea of, of mixing it. You get a much crispier effect when you use Crisco because, you know, it's pure fat and so it's a lovely combination with butter because you get that nice soft crumb that you get from the butter with a little bit of steam action. And you also will have this lovely pastry kind of effect when you're shortening. So, oh, nice hybrid. Okay. Very smart. And Nancy, let's talk about butter for just a minute while this is mixing. Mm -hmm. um, people always say, do I use salted? Do I use unsalted? Can I use inexpensive? Do I have to use expensive butter? I, um, I buy both kinds. I buy Kerrygold unsalted, and I buy the cheap butter unsalted. I will buy a salted butter or one of the cultured butters that you can find locally here for eating. But for cooking, I use the less expensive butters most of the time in cooking. If I'm making croissants or something that needs a very good butter in it to perform, like puff pastry, then I'll use the European butter. And when you use the European butter, you're going to notice it's got a higher fat content, and you know they're 
must be better quality milk saga to do taste a, a benefit. But the key thing is this higher fat content in the butter because it's going to give you a better effect. And, you know, if you're going to do anything that's time intensive, I would definitely go with the more expensive European butter. I like being able to control the salt. That And unsalted butter does give you the ability to do that, you know. Um, if you only have unsalted butter and you have, you know, dinner and you bake some kind of nice bread, you can always make a compound butter. Throw a stick of butter into your food processor or, you know, you can even mash it with a fork if you got it. Any herbs that you've got that are dry, uh, I wouldn't use rosemary. I might use the softer herbs. And then you can put in some garlic as long as it's pulverized and then the salt. And depending on what you're having, you know, just go that direction with the butter. You can even put jams in it as long as you really mix it up very well. Strawberry butter. So, right, honey butter. And so there are a lot of ways that you can take inex the relatively inexpensive butter. Butter's never cheap, but relatively inexpensive butter and turn it into a really interesting thing to eat and yet have your unsalted butter when you're going to do a great recipe like these cherry cookies. Thanks for that great explanation. Oh. All right. And our um, we started with our butter mm -hmm. and our sugar, and then I added our eggs. And now this recipe calls for a mix, again, of vanilla and almond extract. Mm. So um, the almond flavor is just a um, half a, ta half a tablespoon, not half a teaspoon, but half a tablespoon. And it just kind of brings out the cherry flavor as a nice cherry scent. Now he won't like my saying this, but my husband is always fiddles with the math around a tablespoon a little bit because a tablespoon contains three teaspoons. Mm -hmm. And this is also a really good way if you're trying to reinforce a little math with the kids at home to say, <laughs> what would half of three be? And of course you, get, you need your teaspoon measure and you need your half teaspoon measure. So, um, to, to measure that one and a half. Or you can eyeball it because when it comes to flavoring, oh, it'd be terrible to have too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to add our dry ingredients again, which is just flour, baking soda, and salt, and our milk, mm -hmm. as we've been doing. And one of the things that I should have mentioned when I started is um, with the cherries, you want to um, take them out of the jar mm -hmm. and um, drain them, oh, okay. okay? You need to keep the juice, because the juice is going to go in, mm -hmm. um, but you want the cherries to be dried, because otherwise it's going to just add too much liquid to your recipe. You have a soggy cookie in yeah, there. Yeah, a soggy cookie. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, and well, I, it looks like in this recipe then, like with the others, that we we add in our solid, tasty bits at the end, right? Just like we did with the nuts and the chocolate chips. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you put your cherries in too soon, mm -hmm. they're just going to get pulverized. Right. So you want, I cut mine in half or quarters. I want them to have enough pieces to them so you can actually taste them. So we've added, um, we're about to add um, a half a cup of the cherry juice. Okay, that's just from the jar. Nice, pretty pink. Oh, it is. So our dough goes from its usual color, not a pink. Okay. Once again, you've got a cookie that some cooks like to put uh, nuts in and others don't. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister-in-law that I mentioned, she likes to put coconut in. Ooh. So that's different yeah. as well. So these are very kind of basic cookie recipes. Mm -hmm. And then your variations can come. Some people like to put chocolate chips in them mm -hmm. and make mm -hmm. a chocolate cherry cookie. That there couldn't be a problem with that. No but, problem. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think the allergy issues around nuts now are something that whenever you're thinking of, of making a gift to somebody, mm -hmm. if you're not sure, and this is such a lovely cookie. This one in particular is just beautiful. Very holiday. 
as are they all. Uh, but I, I think that in terms of um, the gifting, if you're going to give something, I think I've stopped using that to you. Unless I, unless I know, them. unless you know, yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. If I know, if I know who I'm giving to you, and if you don't, but you still have nuts in it, just always include a little note. Yeah. This cookie contains nuts, or mm -hmm. this cookie contains something that somebody might have a reaction to. Yeah. I'm very careful about using any alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about doing the Italian wine cookie, which is another very traditional cookie, mm -hmm. but so many people don't consume alcohol for any number of reasons. Yeah. So. I thought, no, we don't need that one. Yeah, if you're living sober, you don't need to have that. Challenge. That's right. That's right. Okay, so now I'm going to add my cherries to the dough. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to stop my mixer and put those in because I don't want them to get... Ooh. And Nancy, could you check our biscotti because that timer's pleasure. going off. With pleasure. There we go. All right. So I'm going to mix that in, and like I said, I'm going to also add, oh, aren't those looking pretty? They are looking pretty. Okay. Now, and I'm going to... Shall we go with meatballs next, boss, or would you like to have this guy? Um, they should... Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to add the nuts to this mixture. We added the... Um, the uh, cherries, I'm adding some nuts, and then I'm going to pop this in the refrigerator. This one has to chill overnight. So, no cherry cookies from this batch, but I made a batch earlier, and Nancy and I are going to do what we've been doing, which is flour our hands a little bit. Yeah, and we're just going to make... Um, Balls about the size of a large marble. So a little bigger than a marble, a little smaller than a golf ball. Is that because of the way that they spread? No, I think it's because these, this is a pretty sweet cookie. Mm -hmm. um, and as a matter of fact, as you'll see on the recipe that I posted, the recipe calls for two cups of sugar. Wow. Which I think think is kind of a lot, so I cut it back to um, a cup and three quarters. Um, so I think it's just because it's a pretty sweet cookie and you don't want to have a large one. Yeah. yeah. Another interesting thing about this particular cookie is it takes a couple of days for the cherry and the almond flavors to really get in there. Uh -huh. So. Um, you know, you might taste it right out of the oven and be like, oh, this doesn't have much flavor. Mm -hmm. But we'll give it a couple of days, store it in an airtight container, and I think you'll be really pleased with it later. Oh, yeah. Um, it's another one that you're going to, going to put an icing on. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's a cherry glaze. Ooh. So that's going to be powdered sugar, more of it maraschino cherry juice, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of almond extract to keep that flavor going. Yeah. And then you're just going to use enough milk um, to make the icing um, spreadable. Okay. Yeah. Is this also a dip, or you do it's more of a It's also a dip. Okay. Yep. It's also well, a dip. Well, the wonderful thing about these dip cookies is, is while the frosting's still wet, after you put the cookie down, you can put some holiday sprinkles, right? Exactly. I, yep. I bet these can look really, really festive. Yes. And when you're putting together a cookie platter to bring to someone, mm -hmm. it's nice to have this um, this pink coloring. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that is our last cookie. Oh, these are wonderful gifts. I'm planning to make them all. Okay. And especially because any cookie that, you know, is, is um, stable for longer, that's the best kind of gift. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It makes a nice, a nice gift. You can do them ahead of time and then um, pass them along to your friends, your family, and your coworkers in a safe, safe distance way. Yes, that's right. <laughs> right. So thank you, Karen Glass, and the library. Oh, thank you. This is wonderful for a lot of treat. I look forward to making them and to giving them away. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. No, thank you. <laughs> Biscotti cookies, chocolate meatballs, Cherry drops. <laughs>